Video games are the latest craze to sweep the country and... As some parents think is just too violent for their kids. Será que esses videogames violentos estimulam os jogadores? E a partir do momento onde um enfant veut réussir... It feels that for as long as video games have existed, there has always been some kind of drama or moral panic that soon followed it. But what about the small forgotten controversies? Well, today, I'll be taking a look at the weird and obscure video game controversies around the world and ranking them on a scale from Care Bears all the way to Yikes. So, let's get started. Started. I'm gonna have to open up a can of whoop ass on it. We begin with Redneck Rampage, an FPS released for PCs in 1997 that was moderately popular back in the day, where you play as a redneck trying to rescue their pig from aliens. The game is clearly modeled after Duke Nukem 3D and even uses the same engine. But it was also the target of mild concerns when MSNBC ran a report on it. A game called Redneck Rampage, and it's not for the squeamish. It features violence, blood, and various insidious weaponry, and he makes no apologies for it. The report discusses the technology behind the game, but also the dangers of these sorts of video games. Some experts warn this immersive, almost lifelike experience desensitizes people in a troubling way. You're engaged now as the aggressor. You're engaged as the person who commits the violence, not just someone who watches the violence. There's a good deal of evidence that young children learn better from animation than they do from real life film because animation gets rid of all the extraneous variables. So, is this game dangerous? Let's check it out. Well, I'll give it this. I would argue that this game manages to be even more gruesome than Duke Nukem 3D. Not just with how you take out your enemies, but also because you can drink booze to regain health. But if you drink too much too fast, you get drunk and you'll have to pee it out or barf it out. And not gonna lie, this game is hilarious. The cartoonishly designed enemies, your takedowns and the one-liners are really funny. Which is why it's a shame that this game is just not good. The level design is equal parts confusing and uninteresting. Additionally, you can never tell where keys are meant to be used, so you just have to try them on every locked door until you find the right one. And you can easily soft lock yourself in multiple levels. Like how in level 1, if you waste your dynamite, you cannot destroy this shallow door, preventing your progress. Progress. It's a shame too, because this game had potential. I mean, heck, the music is amazing. But I cannot show it to you because it's all licensed. But the gameplay and level design often feel amateurish at best, and it just ruins the experience. Also, I'm a little suspicious of this MSNBC quote concerned report because they spend more time interviewing the developers and hyping up the technology behind it than they do discussing how dangerous the game is. If I had to guess, I'd say this whole report was paid for by the publisher to drum up some Duke Nukem 3D style controversy and drive up sales. But still, as far as the violence goes, it's… I don't know, it's whatever. If you've played Duke Nukem 3D, you already know what to expect, except this game came out a year after Duke Nukem 3D, so we were all kind of used to it by now. And personally, I think Duke Nukem 3D raised a lot more concerns due to, let's say, other reasons. So yeah, I'm gonna give this one a solid meh out of 10, both in gameplay and controversy. Now we're going straight to Japan with the Atomic Runner Chelna for arcades. Yes, even Japan gets the occasional video game controversy once in a while. Anyway, Atomic Runner Chelnov is a fourth scrolling action game that honestly has more in common with a shmup than a traditional run and gun. And some of you might be familiar with the Sega Mega Drive version, which is simply known as Atomic Runner. In fact, the Sega version is so well made that it's generally considered to be a better game than the arcade original, with a revamped storyline and arguably better graphics. The art style is certainly better at least. The arcade version also has 
some slowdown that is simply not present in the Sega version. Gotta love that blast processing. This game does take a bit of getting used to though, as it's always scrolling, but enemies can come from anywhere. But if you want to fire behind you, you need to press a specific button to switch sides. And this really messes with my brain. But once you get used to it, Atomic Runner Chelnov becomes an incredibly fun game regardless of which version you're playing. So, what's wrong with this game you might be wondering? Well, there was a roundtable interview with the developers at Data East and it's mentioned that during the Chernobyl plant incident, a TV station interviewed one of the managers at the studio due to the fact that you play as a Soviet superhero with nuclear powers whose name is suspiciously similar to the Chernobyl plant. The developer did try to explain their stance, but it seems that the news crew only ran the most interesting segments of that interview, which in turn made Daddy East look like a bunch of opportunists. Even a popular news anchor in Japan added the remark, and I quote, What the hell is this trash? when sharing his thoughts on how insensitive this game was. Unfortunately though, try as I might, I could not find this news segment, which is a shame. In the end though, Daddy East complained to the TV station, and the TV station in turn sent them a canned apology and just let the whole topic fizzle out. So yeah, a relatively minor controversy, but it did result in the game being renamed to simply Atomic Runner when the Sega version launched in the West. So. Do I think this is a major issue? No, not really. Especially when the issue was really just the name. I'm gonna give this one a good old Care Bear stare. You should still check out the Sega version though, it's an excellent game. Video games are the latest craze to sweep the country and most of the world too. Million we now move back to the US in 1982 with a news report by ABC News sharing concerns over how addicting video games can be and what health concerns we should expect as parents, both physically and in terms of mental health. There is probably no true physical dependence. On the other hand, there certainly is a psychological dependence in the sense that this is a gratifying experience that the uh, person's peer relationships, uh, source of self-esteem, enjoyment in life, are wrapped up in video games. The report even goes on to talk about something known as Pac-Man Wrist, which I have never heard up to this point. As you can see, 65% of those surveyed suffered some injury, blisters, calluses, arthralgia or pain, or tendonitis, from their fingers to their shoulders. The development of the calluses and blisters are obvious, the complaints and the swelling secondary to the injury to the tendons were while they were standing at the tables playing the games. But the report states that it's a major health concern for any parent. Apparently, various towns and cities were even banning arcades over these health concerns. But midway through this report, they interviewed the president of Taro America. And it's kind of funny because all he talks or cares about is the money. We go by what we call what's in the cash box. You know, the cash, like I was mentioning, the cash box is a cruel mistress. And that's what we go by. And it's a very tough dollar. And it's getting tougher. It's not easy. We all want that same buck. Also, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but this is not what I expected when I heard the words President of Taro America. Anyway, the reporters are given exclusive access to a new game Taro is developing, Toasters and Chainsaws. Alright, we got a game, let's check it out and see if it's worth the drama. Wait, where is it? Is this game real? Was it cancelled? Okay, so you're not gonna believe this. People over at the Atari H forums had the exact same question I did some 10 years ago. And are you ready for this? None of what Taro America said in their interview was real. Basically, they took the reporters to the smallest, most cramped and most remote room they could find, fed them a bunch of lies about how it's a super secret top development department called Deep Engineering, had two guys over there pretending to be working on a super secret video game and show them some joke concept art for a game that not only ever existed, but was never even planned to ever exist. 
The Doctor and Chainsaw's art was just some cool art that Tim created for fun and it was never meant to exist as a game. That is insane! And the reporters believed all of it. This guy lied through all of his teeth throughout his interview and the ABC just ran with it. What a f giga chat! I literally have no words and no game. So, with no game to review, I think there's only one rating we can give here, and that's aimed at the president of Taito. Giga Chad. He's just one big Giga Chad. This was just incredible. I am seriously at a loss for words. Taito let us videotape in a room called Deep Engineering. Without being overdramatic about the whole thing, this is the most secure room in the plant. This is where the game gets its life and personality from computer programmers. Because of the fierce competition among video game companies, Taito requested we do not use last names. But Rex is working with Mark on a new game called Toasters and Chainsaws. This is Escape from Hell by EA for PC, a 1990 RPG that uses the Wasteland engine. This is a comedy RPG in which you find an incantation that unwittingly transports you and your girlfriend to the Underworld, and now it's your job to rescue her. You do this by walking around the various settlements of the damned, and the first NPC you recruit to your party is none other than Stalin. Yes. That's Stalin, who, by the way, has now become a full-blown capitalist and even runs a group called Capitalists for a Free Hell. And after that, I quickly ran into Genghis Khan, who also joined my party. And rather than shops, you get your gear from defeating enemies or raiding places like weapon supplies or trash cans. In my case, I had a team comprised of Stalin, Genghis Khan or Hamlet, and we were traveling around hell, wielding broadswords and nail guns, defeating demons and skeletons, while using trash can lids for shields. This game is amazing, at least concept-wise. The game tries to be funny, but a lot of the jokes are hit or miss, like how the game describes video game piracy as the ultimate crime. Or how the super faithful, holier than thou denizens refused to believe that they ended up in hell for being bad people, and instead believed they were sent here to convert others. You'll also notice that all female character models come in two varieties, scantily clad and less than that. And the game is clearly inspired by Dante's Divine Comedy, as you're meant to travel across the various circles of hell, and you go down to the second circle by finding a parachute and jumping off a hole. But Without a doubt, the most controversial aspect of this game is that you get to recruit him. You know, Mr. Austrian Painter Man. Yes, he joins your party. Basically, you find him in hell and he thanks you for reading his book. Uh, okay. And then he joins you, which, not gonna lie, it's kinda weird having him on my team. But the thing is, I'm probably making this game sound a lot more interesting than it actually is. Because the truth is, there's barely any story here. Like for example, you see this dialogue window with Stalin, you might be wondering, why is he a capitalist now? What drove him to change his ideology? And you'll never know, because this is literally all the dialogue you ever get with him. Other than being a party member, he never interacts with you or your other teammates outside of this one dialogue. And the same goes for everyone else, and it does not help that what little story elements there are feel nonsensical and tied by only the barest of threads. So as a result, the game really ends up having all the death of a Family Guy cutaway joke that was stretched into a full-blown RPG. This game is basically all edge and no point. And you might think I'm being harsh here. Here, but even the creator himself said that he did not mean to make any political statements when he made this game. He was just basically trying to be funny and edgy. It's also hard to blame the developer for the lack of a proper storyline when EA kept slashing their budget to the point where Hell only has three circles instead of nine, and most plot points had to be abandoned. So the game feels genuinely unfinished. Still, I don't think the game is bad by 1990 DOS standards, 
but it's not terribly interesting. The creator would later share in an interview that several retailers refused to stock his game over its questionable content. I think that this is just an edgy RPG whose joke wears thin sooner rather than later. So I'm gonna file this one under, yeah, I get it. Next up, we have Little Enforcers, which, according to a 1995 Channel 4 news report, was banned from Little Saigon in arcades due to fears of how realistic it looked? Parents are often the first to ask, could this lead to this? In Westminster, police and planning commissioners say yes. It is why they have pulled the plug on four video games at the proposed Joyland Arcade in Little Saigon. At Stanton's Golfland, manager Ken Beck understands the concern, but he says games like the band Lethal Enforcer, a sort of high-tech take on the old Wild West. And, <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I get what they mean by realistic, but to me, this just looks like something made in Microsoft Paint. Actually, I am being kinda mean, because the game is legitimately fun, even if it's nowhere near my favorite light gun game. That would be the Time Crisis series. Ironically, though, for as quote, realistic as these games look, it's really super tame as enemies merely flash when you hit them. There's really nothing here that would make anyone squeamish, so I guess the concerns are more related to the fact that you're using a weapon and that the enemies are photos of real people. Yeah, I'm just gonna mark this one as Care Bears. Also on the banned list, Virtua Fighter. Even joystick junkies say it doesn't matter where they put their tokens, the threat is not the plastic gun, but the people. Oh, Virtua Fighter as well? Okay. Actually, I'm not sure if she means Virtua Fighter 1 or 2, but she's showing the sequel in the report, so I'm gonna go with that one. And... This is a joke, right? Like, out of all the fighting games you could have chosen, you went with Virtua Fighter? Really? Virtua Fighter, the least violent, least fanservice-y fighting game series ever made. That's the one you pick. Even Clay Fighters has more questionable content than Virtua Fighter. Yeah, this is Care Bears level stuff. Seriously, Little Enforcer and Virtua Fighter? What were they thinking? We now jump all the way to Mexico. The year is 1993 and the place, a popular Mexican talk show called Yuste Kiopina, which roughly translates to What About You? What do you think? In this episode, the show is discussing the popularity of video games and the impact it could have on the children. And so, the show brings in several guests to discuss the pros and cons of each side, including two medical psychiatrists, the president of Sega Mexico, the editor of a Nintendo fan magazine, a video game and arcade distributor, a few game collectors, and a Sega fanboy. Yeah, that's literally how they introduce him. He's just Sega Gamer. And that's it. And at first, the show goes about as you'd expect, with the psychologists explaining their concerns over video games, and they even name two video games, one of which is Carmen San Diego, which imparts positive lessons, and the other is Street Fighter 2, which does the opposite. Alright, we got ourselves a game, but before we go there, let's see what else they bring up. But once this hour and a half episode reaches the 21 minute mark, that's when this show just goes completely off the rails. Because they start interviewing the kids in the audience, and rather than paying attention to the serious topic at hand, they just start asking for release dates on popular video games. And at that point, the arcade game distributor and the Sega rep just go into full on sales mode. Suddenly, this guy is promoting Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo on the Super Nintendo, which in turn motivates the kids to start asking even more video game related questions, which culminates with this kid asking literally the worst thing he could have asked here. Which is cooler, the Mega Drive or Super Nintendo? And my god, it was the worst question he could have asked, because the crowd just goes wild and starts screaming. <laughs> ¿Qué es lo que, qué, 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 perdón? ¿Qué es lo que, qué, 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 qué
You even see the host, who did not understand the question, just take the microphone away. But it was too little, too late, because after this point, all bets were off, and the host lost any semblance of control over his own TV show. Because now, this guy says Sega is the best because it has the better graphics, his friends agree, this guy disagrees, the Sega president just takes this chance and tells everyone that Mortal Kombat is coming and to check out their showroom, this guy says you're all wrong and that the Amiga is very set, this guy starts saying oh yeah, well we at Nintendo, we're getting a city-based 32-bit console, so we're number one. Then this dude throws more fuel to the fire and says that Sega sucks and Sega Street Fighter 2 sucks even harder and that the Super Nintendo is red set. And then this guest answers, nuh uh, the Nintendo version is like the arcade and the Sega version is the arcade, you just don't know what the hell you're talking about. And then this kid accuses the Nintendo magazine editor of being a big fat liar and no way does the Super Nintendo have 16 bits, it's at best a supercharged 12 bit system. <laughs> okay, let me try that again. <laughs> accuses the Nintendo Magazine editor of being a big fat liar and no way does the Super Nintendo have 16 bits, it's at best a supercharged 12 bit system and that Sega rules and Nintendo drools and people clap and cheer in the background. And then, the full grown adult just starts arguing with a little child over who has a better video game system on live national television, while the trained psychologists are just like, what is going on here? I thought we are supposed to discuss video game violence. This is incredible! I have never seen a, are video games ruining our children panel go so completely off the rails. And meanwhile, the Nintendo slash arcade distributor and the Sega president are just going, buy my game, buy my game, buy my game, buy my game. You know what, there's only one rating I could give here. Giga Chads. You're all a bunch of beautiful, sweaty console warrior Giga Chads. Each and every one of you. I salute you. Oh, right, I'm supposed to review Street Fighter 2. It's Street Fighter 2. There, that's my review. O preguntarle al señor de la revista, estoy enterado y estoy casi seguro que el Super Nintendo tiene 12 bits supercargados y están diciendo que es de 16 bits y el Genesis es de 16 bits y este y no puede tener un, un mejores gráficas, uno de 12 bits turbo a uno de 16 bits. Next up, we have Dreamweb, an adventure game launched for PCs and the Amiga, though we'll be taking a look at the PC version. And this game would end up being removed from store shelves in Australia. You play as a bartender named Ryan and you're having visions of being transported into a post-apocalyptic future by some unknown cult who revealed to you that unless you take out some highly influential people like musicians and wealthy businessmen, they will bring about the end of the world. So you're then sent back to your cyberpunk time with a mission to eliminate them. What makes the game interesting though is that it's never made clear how much of your visions are actually real. And this is because Ryan is a down his luck bartender who's just been fired, lives in squalor and has generally been forgotten by society. So as you're playing through the game, you just just kind of asking yourself if you're really doing the right thing or if these visions are all just happening inside Ryan's mind. Or if maybe the cult is actually real but they're just using Ryan for some unknown reason. And honestly, the first chapter of this game is quite possibly one of the greatest opening acts in adventure game history. The game's mix of noir storytelling with an early 90s interpretation of a cyberpunk dystopic future and an to learn more about what is really going on here really help in creating an engaging, albeit limited world. So you'll go around talking to people and picking up items as you witness Ryan's not so slow descent into madness. I especially love when Ryan takes it upon himself to buying a weapon. It just feels so tense and well written as he comes to terms with what he's about to do and all for the sake of a series of dreams that may not even be real to begin with. Yeah, something that's easy to use. I've never used a gun before, but I need to now. I need to kill him. Please, Ryan, 
don't tell me any more than I need to know. Although the box does come with a cool booklet in which Ryan writes down his thoughts and the sent into madness. It kind of reads like a manifesto and it's a super interesting bit of real world material to get you into the game. And, well, I'm sure you can guess why Australia took issue with Dreamweb. Not only are some of your takedowns really out there, but the game also had no issues with displaying love scenes. And then, of course, you have the game's topic, which is arguably even more relevant today than it was back then. Now, to be fair, the game did end up having a re-release in some markets with these scenes considerably toned down. But I'd say it's the theme itself that is the real issue here. But the game isn't doing this for shock value. It's clearly trying to tell a story and doing so in a way where it's up to the player to interpret Ryan's actions. So I feel the game's untimely fate in Australia was just some growing pains that were inevitable as the media matures. Because of that, I'm going to give this game a... Yeah, I get it. I get the decision, but I don't agree with it. Dreamweb is a game that really needs to be experienced, even if it's just for a YouTube long play. And if you take the YouTube route, I recommend to check out Dungeon Chill's review. It's a really good deep dive. A man a little younger than myself lies with his head firmly on the table. He's asleep and obviously drunk. His jacket sleeve is in a pool of beer and he snores quite loudly. The man lies in front of me snoring. Hey! Wake up, I need to talk to you! We now move on from Australia to Brazil with Doom 2. I guess I shouldn't be surprised to find a Doom game here. That series is always getting accused of something or other. Though, unless you're from Brazil or Portugal, I'm sure you've never heard of this one. Basically, back in the 90s there was a pastor in Brazil who went on a trip to the US and bought himself a copy of the ultimate add-on collection for Doom and Doom 2, and then brought it to his congregation to profess the dangers of video games. This recording was completely forgotten over the years until it resurfaced again a couple of years ago and went viral on Brazilian social media. And with good reason too, because the man would end up giving the single greatest review of Doom I've ever seen in my life. Para você, olha este Nintendo que trouxe dos Estados Unidos para você ver. É novinho, é um CD. Está Satanás na capa. Sabe o que que di... sabe como é que se diz esse Nintendo, esse videogame? Sabe o que que diz aqui atrás? How is hell? Como é o inferno? Sabe o que está escrito aqui atrás? Sente-se e relaxa-te. Deixe as legiões te possuir. E você descobrirá os secretos daqueles que foram antes que você ao inferno e como chegar lá. Se chama Doom Number Two. Destruição número 2. O diabo não está brincando contigo! Ok, this was amazing. I would pay real money to watch the dude review every game like this. Heck, I wish I had this kind of energy when reviewing games. But okay, I guess we're gonna check out Doom 2. And, well, it's Doom 2. I don't know what to tell you. You fire at zombies and demons, you use chainsaws, it's fun as heck. I mean, sure, it's gruesome, and you travel to hell and find all sorts of imagery over there. But even back then I had trouble taking this seriously, due to how pixelated it looked. But, I mean, is there any point in me reviewing Doom? I'm just gonna mark this one as a meh. It's a great game, but come on now, there's no need for all this drama. <laughs> Yes, we're back to Princess Maker 2. Kinda crazy how I just covered this game a few months ago and now we're back here for completely different reasons. Anyway, Princess Maker 2 is a life simulation game in which you're the hero of a fantasy land and as a reward for your noble actions you're given a daughter by the gods. And now you have to raise her from a 10 year old girl into a well adjusted adult. And I think I've mentioned this before but I absolutely love this game. 
game. This is one of my favorite MS-DOS games ever made. And the freedom it gives you in how you raise your daughter is insane, giving you over 80 endings and multiple paths. Do you want to treat this game like your regular RPG and turn your daughter into a fighter or a mage, fighting random battles and tournaments for money and glory? You can do that. Do you want this to be a traditional life simulation game where she goes to school and focuses on part-time jobs? Knock yourself out! This is a game that always gives back whatever you put into it. And that's kind of the problem, because this game is actually a port of a PC-98 release. And if you're familiar with the PC-98, I'm sure you can guess what that means. And indeed, a lot of newspaper articles were printed about this game, though the source seems to always be the same. Basically, they discussed what an odd concept for a game this is, if the concept itself is appropriate at all, and they took issue with some of the game's less savory content, including the provocative dresses you can make your daughter wear, as well as the ending in which she marries you, the player, who is also meant to be her father. They even interviewed a professor of women's studies in Tokyo, who basically agreed that the game was concerning, and that she was against what it represented. And from there on, the media just ran with it. In fact, even this release I'm playing right now was actually never launched in the West. This was in fact a beta shared in trade shows where the game was fully playable but some endgame dialogue was still missing. But the full Western release of the game simply ended up not happening and the game got super popular because people shared the beta online. And I distinctly remember that every abandoned where forum and website back in the day would cite these news articles as a reason as to why the game never launched in the West, though the developers later clarified that it was actually because their publisher went bankrupt and they simply couldn't find a new one because the game was almost 4 years old at that point. It's kind of funny how this controversy haunted Princess Maker 2 for years only for it to end up completely forgotten. So, is the controversy warranted? Well, yeah. Kinda. I mean, like I said, this game is excellent and it garnered a dedicated cult following regardless of gender. And 95% of the content is extremely wholesome. But it really does have some questionable content. But on the other hand, this game only gives as good as it gets. Meaning that with the exception of the mermaids here, you won't find any questionable content if you don't actively go looking for it. If you want to enjoy the game without any spicy scenes, you have have two remakes available to you, both of which do away with these scenes. And if you want the full original experience, the MS-DOS version is free and super easy to find. I also think it's the better version out of the three if we're being honest. I mean, I think the art style is better and it fits the game better because it's simpler and it kind of feels like you're viewing the world through the eyes of a child, but that could just be my nostalgia talking. Either way, I'm going to mark this one as a yeah. I get it. Though I still hope that we get the rest of this series in the West at some point. I know I did my part. This is Guilty Gear for the original PlayStation, and I mean, I think this series needs no introduction. It's such a stylish fighting game, though I have to admit, this was my first time playing the first game in the series. And you know what? It totally holds up. Honestly, I'm surprised this was a PlayStation exclusive, because it looks and feels like a Sega Saturn game instead. And as far as any unacceptable material goes, there's really nothing here that stands out. Sure, it's got some blood, but it's no worse than Mortal Kombat in that regard. So why am I talking about it? Because Bill Clinton talked about it. Yes! Really? During a press interview, Bill Clinton was talking about the horrors of violent video games and their marketing, and he started giving multiple examples of games whose magazine adverts simply went too far. I was given uh, today, Arthur brought me the magazine with the ad that uh that he mentioned, and he was kind enough to mark it for me. There really is a gun here It says, more fun than shooting your neighbor's cat. I was 
given another ad that says, what kind of psycho drives a school bus into a war zone? And here's a school bus heavily armed. Sadly, we don't know most of those adverts, but we do know this one. And here's one that's the most unbelievable all that says, your friends guilt free. And there it is. As one YouTube commenter said, this is the most exposure Guilty Gear ever got in the 90s. Oh man, yeah, this one gets the Care Bears from me. Come on, Billy Boy, you can do better than this. This is cannon fodder for Amiga computers, and it's a team-based RTS in which you need to command your soldiers through a series of objectives, like defeating every enemy, destroying all enemy buildings, that sort of thing. As you explore the levels, you'll also find crates with special weapons like grenades and the like. And I gotta say, this was my first time playing the game and honestly, I fell in love with it. I've only ever known the console versions up to this point, which seemed fine, I guess, but it's pretty clear that this was built for computers, as not only are the controls better, but so is the music. I mean, it even has its own theme song. And I like how each level begins showing you how many people are volunteering for service, and any soldier you lose is gone forever. Not only that, but once the next mission comes around, you see their graves right next to the new set of volunteers. Like, there's some really clever parody in this game, it's honestly impressive for the time. Which is why it's so funny how it went over the media's head in the UK and there was a massive stink about it. And what was the issue, you might ask? Basically, the game's cover was going to prominently feature a poppy, which resembles the symbol of Remembrance Day. It all began when the British newspaper Daily Star ran a story criticizing its use and then it just became a huge thing over there. You had the British Legion calling this game appalling, members of parliament decrying the game's use of the poppy, and even British nobility threw their hat into the ring. The criticism even spread to Amiga Power magazine because it planned to use the poppy as its cover. In the end though, the game's cover was ultimately changed and the magazine also had to change its planned cover and even issued an apology. Even the game opens up with a message saying that it's not endorsed by the Royal British Legion. It's quite funny how stirred people were over this, only for it to basically become completely forgotten soon after, and over something that feels so small. And honestly, considering how the game was meant to be a parody and how its visuals and gameplay are pretty tame at best and humorous at worst, this whole thing can only get a Care Bears rating from me. Check out the game though, it's pretty great. Virgin soldiers? Now that's the real tragedy here. This is Mass Effect, and I feel this is most likely the most well-known controversy on this video, but the resolution is something that usually seems to be forgotten. So, for those who don't know, Mass Effect is an RPG series by Bioware, and in typical Bioware fashion, you can make multiple choices during the game that will resolve quests differently and impress or annoy your companions. And as you form relationships with them, depending on your character, it can result in a short and honestly kind of awkward love scene. Well, Fox News took a real issue with this, and so they brought in Jeff Keighley, you know, before the whole Hello Doritos debacle, and feminist author Cooper Lawrence, and it went as well as you expected. Cooper was throwing all sorts of accusations and information that was just factually wrong, and Jeff tried to correct her, but was constantly being interrupted by the news anchor. 30 plus hour experience. And Jeff, to destroy let me ask you something. Jeff, let me ask you a question. I, I have not played this game. 
I went on the website today. I clicked on a lot of different trailers. I tried to learn as much about it uh, as I right. could before we did this. You know, it's interesting. When you click on it, it asks you your age. It says you must go through a scanning mm -hmm. process. So I thought, oh, this is going to take forever. Okay, so I, I put in my age, and then boom, you're in. No problem. So that is a pretty easy right. screen to get past. What you may not know, though, is that a few weeks later, there was a follow-up interview with the New York Times, though it was in written form only. In it, Cooper Lawrence stated that she hadn't played the game, something which, to be fair, she also admitted during the Fox interview. Yeah, it's completely incorrect. First of all, you can actually play as a man or a woman in the game. Cooper, have you ever played Mass Effect? No. And then basically said that, yeah, the game's fine. Apparently, Fox told her that the game was like porn, but that in reality, she's seen episodes of Lost that were way worse. She actively stated that she regrets saying the things she did on camera, and even sent an email to Fox calling the whole segment insulting and asking for the network to correct their mistake. Of course Fox did none of this. Basically, Fox already had what they wanted. They stirred up both sides, spit them against each other, got their audience ratings and moved on. And as I'm sure you all know, Mass Effect is fine. It's completely fine. If anything, I take a bigger issue with how this game was the start of Bioware's era of You're a Jedi, Harry. I mean Grey Warden. I mean Jedi. I mean Spectre. But yeah, whatever. This game and this whole controversy gets a big ol' meh from me. Next up, we have Harvester, a point-and-click adventure game that was banned in Germany. You wake up in what seems to be an overly exaggerated version of 1950s America and you have no memory of who you are or how you got here. All you know is that everything seems wrong. And everything is indeed wrong, as your father seems to be a prisoner in his own house, your brother is watching overly violent TV shows, your baby sister is feeding on bugs, people are weird, aggressive or speak to you in in windows. But now, I think maybe you need a little more quality time. What do you mean, quality time? Some, like Miss Whaley, favor stern discipline, corporal punishment, as a means of socialization. Myself, I temper discipline with love. The game is weird, uncomfortable and oddly fascinating, as you're always wondering what you'll run into next or what people will say next. Not helped by the fact that the town seems to be run by a secret group known only as the Lodge, with everyone telling you that you should join it, and when you do try to join it, they just keep giving you increasingly weird and gruesome requirements to get in. I think it also helps that a lot of the worst segments you see here are either implied, limited by the technology or played for laughs. I mean, granted, it is dark humor, but I do feel that it achieves what it's trying to do in that regard. Honestly, Harvester is not a good game, but it is an interesting game. And again, I feel it's one of those adventure games that works better if watched through a long play instead of actually playing it yourself, especially because some of these puzzles can be pretty difficult. I will say though that unlike Escape from Hell, Harvester does seem to have an actual message and the point. But what about studies that have shown that children become more violent when watching violence? Buckaroo, I rip the guts out of godless heathen engines. Most kids don't see godless heathen engines on a regular basis, and if they do, they better either get their eyes checked or do like old Range Rider and shoot the bejesus out of them. And the game is also infamous for having one of the most awkward romance scenes in all of gaming history.
Man, that's the stuff of legends right there. I would honestly give this whole thing a bigger rating if it weren't for the fact that the game's creators actively went out of their way to make sure that the game was controversial. In fact, in 1996, psychiatrist David Walsh released the list of unsavory video games to avoid during a press conference, and Harvester's creators were mad that they did make the list and tried to stir things up on purpose. I don't know, I feel that if you're trying to be edgy on purpose, it kind of backfires and undermines the whole thing. So I'm just gonna give this one a big ol' eh. It does make for an interesting playthrough though, check it out if you can. Hulk, who goes there? It's just me, Steve. What do you want? Did the llamas send you? I knew it. They won't leave me alone. Them and the kookaburros. Nine! Nine! Alright, so this next one is a bit interesting. In 1993, a New York Post article came out decrying the savagery in a certain Sega Genesis video game. And I want you to guess what game I'm talking about. The article claimed that the game was steeped in mindless graphic violence, and that the author was so shocked that they went to a toy store to check out the Nintendo version, but it was no better. And the article even states, and I quote, what we found at the toy store was more than disturbing, it was sickening and depressing, everyone's working off a copy of the same twisted plan. The object of Cell is fighting, maiming and delighting in the graphic violence. So, have you guessed the game yet? Mortal Kombat? Maybe Splatterhouse? Or maybe Super Nintendo and 32X Doom? But nope, it was, and I kid you not, NHL 93. Seriously? This is the game you're on about? A freaking sports game. Out of all the games you could have complained about, this is the one that ignites your righteous fury? And all because there's a portion of the game where two players start trading blows? Man, even the Care Bears are calling the author of this article a weenie. I will say though, that this was my first time playing NHL 93, and I honestly liked it a lot more than I thought I would. Maybe there's something to be said about old sports games. The funny thing though is that EGM magazine would go on to publish this opinion article as well, and their fan mail would be flooded with responses, which all went about as well as you'd expect. But still, yeah, this one is way below even Care Bears level. Honestly, this one is just embarrassing. Speaking of embarrassing, we now move on to Spain, where a news article came out expressing concern over Mad Dog McCree. Why you might ask? Because it's real people and you're using a weapon. Honestly, not a lot to say here, because I don't think it sparked too much of a controversy. Really, the best I could find was a short newspaper clipping. But hey, it's there. Though if you know anything about Mad Dog McCree, you know that this is another Care Bears level issue. I mean, come on, the game is super campy and played for laughs. Seriously guys, please find better games to complain about. Looking at my keys, stranger? You wouldn't be trying to get the sheriff out of jail now, would you? Chaco! Huh? Show him what we did in trouble. <laughs> But just because something is campy and played for laughs, it does not mean that I sometimes do not agree with the people crying foul, because we now jump to my home country of Portugal and the little ZX Spectrum game called Paradise Cafe. Also, yeah, I'm gonna have to use a lot of euphemisms for this one, so bear with me here. This is a... 
Prosperity launched for the system in which you need to find the weapon, stick at people for their wallets and blow it all on uh, ladies of the night. And you can also engage in close encounters with old ladies. And yeah, I get that it was something played for laughs. I mean, this was the most popular ZX Spectrum game in my country by far. Literally everyone had a copy of Paradise Cafe. And believe it or not, there was no outrage. Yeah, no one cared. I remember being like 8 years old, my dad caught me playing this game where my character was in jail and basically just having fun with himself. And my dad was like, wow, games today sure can be silly. Right, son? And then left me to it. Maybe that does explain my thumbnails. But yeah, no one cared. That is, until 2021, when some game design college students took it upon themselves to remake the game and the project was being led by their college professor. And to be fair, as far as I can tell, the issue with the remake isn't so much that it was being remade, I mean, we're all on the internet, we've seen far worse than this, but that the entire project had the backing of the professor and the University, which, yeah, okay, I know it's a classic in my country, but maybe having actual learning institutions back this remake might not be the best decision. And bear in mind, I am being very careful with the words and euphemisms I pick when describing this game. Because this game, even though it's a parody, it's really out there. And I think everyone basically agrees that the game is honestly really terrible. It basically survives on the shock and novelty value. Values, but once they wear off, and trust me, it does not take long for that to happen, it's a game that really amounts to little more than a waste of time. But yeah, there haven't been any news on the remake since, so I assume it's been cancelled. Because of that, this one gets a big ol' yikes from me, dog. And no, I do not recommend you track this one down. And finally, we move on to Phantasmagoria for PCs, which was banned in… Australia? Again? The hell is going on over there? Anyway, this is a game that basically set the standard for point-and-click FMV style adventure games. And it was a pet project of Roberta Williams, whom, in case you're not familiar, she was the creator of the King's Quest series and she basically was to the point-and-click adventure genre what John Romero and John Carmack were to the FPS genre. Anyway, this game was meant to be a more mature approach to the genre, so she made Phantasmagoria a horror game. And there even are some scenes that I need to cherry pick to post on here. Interestingly enough, this game is generally not well received by the adventure gaming crowd because it's considered a bit too simple for its own good. But that's also why I have no trouble recommending it. Most puzzles here are rather basic, which in turn makes Phantasmagoria a very good entry point for newcomers to the genre. And I have to say, for a game that is supposed to be horror-centric, I find myself laughing a lot more than I do being scared. I mean, for one thing, the acting is either stilted, over-the-top goofy or both. And I mean, this is meant to be a horror game, but half the time, the characters act like they are in a Looney Tunes short. That was amazing. But my favorite has to be the villain, because of just how full-on cartoonishly evil he is. Harry? Harry? I'm really hungry, honey. Let's order some pizza. A little extra sauce, huh? Mm -hmm. Man, that is glorious! Though I will admit that there are some really good bad ending scenes that honestly would have been right at home in an 80s slasher movie. But other than that, I don't know, I find this game more goofy than anything else. And considering it's a fairly easy adventure game, I say go for it and check it out if you can.
And there you go! A selection of controversies you most likely never heard of before. Are there any games I missed? Let me know in the comments. In the meantime, I'd like to thank all my Patreon supporters, including my newest backers, Alexander, Glitch Gremlin, and Rob Reviolent. Thank you for helping make the channel better. Anyway, I hope you have a great day. Bye!